The oldest race of people on Earth, the Australian Aborigines, were safe here in their island stronghold. As the years passed in their thousands, the islands that have formed the ancient land bridge to Australia would be invaded and infiltrated many times. Arabs, Hindus, Chinese and Malays would conquer the islands to the north of the Great Southland, but they would never venture further than Timor. If the occasional ancient mariner did call here, it was only to look and then hurry away for lands greener and richer. If some Arab or Malay sea captain did reach the western coast, it is important only academically, for if they came, they held no threat to the Aboriginal. That threat was to come from another quarter, and that quarter was Europe. In the 15th century, when Christendom lost Constantinople and the remnants of the old Eastern Roman Empire to the Turks, they also lost the great caravan route to the east. The only alternative was a sea route to the Indies and beyond to China. Now, in those days, it was a fantastic proposal. But in 1492, a Genoese sailor named Christopher Columbus sailed west in search of a sea route to India and found instead America. And six years later, a Portuguese sailor, Vasco da Gama, rounded the Cape of Good Hope and sailed east. The Portuguese had found the fabulous sea route to Cathay and the Spice Islands. Soon they controlled the Far East with a string of trading ports. Eventually, if they'd been left alone, they may have discovered the great southern land and settled it. But something happened. It is true that we of the Netherlands are a small nation, a mere collection of provinces. We are enclosed by the sea on three sides, and much of our land is dunes and bog. Consequently, the main business of our nation is shipping and commerce. Quite frankly, our merchants and traders aren't going to sit about while the Spanish and Portuguese carve up the new world. So I am pleased to announce that under a treaty signed in this year of our Lord, 1602, a company from the six regions of the Netherlands has been granted a monopoly to trade east of the Cape of Good Hope to the Straits of Magellan. This monopoly is empowered to conclude treaties, wage war, and build forts and strongholds in its quest for the spices and wealth of the Orient. In the six years that followed, the Dutch sent 65 ships in search of the spices and treasure of the Indies. They formed the Dutch East India Company and like the Portuguese before them, were soon sailing within a few hundred miles of the great Southland. European man was now near the legend, the legend of a lost land to the south. Greek scholars had placed a mythical land in the southern seas to balance their theory and maps of a round earth. The Bible spoke of the long-lost land of Ophir, and the Chinese made their fantasy a mystical place somewhere south of Timor. But to the Malays, the legendary great Southland was known as something else. It was the land of the dead.
The Dutch had been active in the Indies for only 10 years when one of their yachts, the Dijkken, accidentally sailed into the land of the dead. She had been exploring the southern coast of New Guinea and somehow missed the narrow strait that separates that country from Australia. The reefs and islands tricked the Dijkken and she sailed south to become the first European ship to find the island continent of Australia. Her captain only confirmed the Malayan legend. He saw dry, barren, waterless land and sailed away unimpressed. To him, the land of the dead offered little. But the next visitor was impressed. He was the first European to set foot on the Australian continent. Hartog had been following a newly devised route to the Indies, which required sailing 4,000 miles east along latitude 36 degrees, taking advantage of a reliable wind called the Roaring Forties. The secret was to turn north at exactly 110 degrees and then proceed straight to Batavia. But there was just one catch, and Hartog was the first of many to be caught. The problem was this clock. He didn't have one. This mechanical masterpiece, the Harrison clock, was needed by mariners to calculate the distance they travelled east or west each day. Without the Harrison chronometer, they could only hazard their position. But it would be another 150 years before its invention. Without the sea clock, Dutchmen had to all but guess their way across the vast Indian Ocean. As more ships followed in the wake of Hartog, they too would misjudge the 4,000 miles and find themselves hard up against the treacherous west coast of the Great South Land. One was Frederick de Houtman. Three years after Hartog, he found himself caught in a sea of rocky islands and hidden reefs. He named the island group Abrolos, which meant open your eyes. And then he sailed away to leave this horror for other of his countrymen to find. No doubt Houtman's Abrolos was marked on the Dutch charts, but the warning open your eyes wasn't sufficient to save the next caller. He too was a Dutchman, though no ordinary sea captain. He was, in fact, the highest ranking officer in the Dutch East India Company. He was Commander Francois Pelsart, President of the Fleet, and he was aboard the finest vessel the company owned. She was the newly commissioned flagship Batavia. Her destination was her namesake, the castle of Batavia on Java. Aboard, Batavia carried a king's ransom in jewels and coin. Also, there were two priceless treasures. One, under Pelsart's personal care, was an ancient agat vase owned by his friend, the artist Rubens. The other, an incredible cameo carved in the 4th century for the Roman Emperor Constantine. It was on its way to the east to be sold to an Indian Mughal prince.
Eventually, most of the passengers, Pelsart and some crew members, reached safety on the shallow island. And the survivors prepared themselves for the task of staying alive and dreaming of their rescue. The remaining crew, under the leadership of a mutinous officer named Geronimus Cornelis, stayed aboard. They were mainly non-swimmers and feared the hazardous row ashore. For eight days they preferred the safety of Batavia's hull. For eight days they drank and cursed the name of Pelsart. <laughs> Pelsart, president of the fleet of the Grand Dutch East India Company, sneaked quietly away in the ship's boat, deserting 250 men, women and children. He sneaked away 48 hours after his ship struck rock. He left 180 here on the island and 70 more on the sinking Batavia. When Commander Pelsart deserted us, we felt sad and miserable. We had neither food nor wine for four or five days. Then we were forced to drink our own urine. On the eighth day, the rest of the mutinous crew members under Cornelis left the disintegrating ship and struggled ashore. And of course, there was the treasure of a Roman emperor and chests of silver coin to keep them reminded of a Europe 10,000 miles away. Cornelius' plan was simple. He would reduce their numbers. Hey, sir, John van Brummel. Take this sword and see if it is sharp enough to cut off the head of Cohen Aldatz. He take it. And cut the sword of Stothel's toe. People started to disappear. Cornelius told us they'd been taken to another island. They hadn't. They were put on a raft, bound hands and legs, and thrown into the sea. They, men, women and children, to that island over there, Seal Island. They were all murdered. 
pregnant women and children. They went around terrorizing everyone. Cornelius ordered me and my eldest daughter to his tent for a meal. He said one of his bloody cutthroats wished to marry my daughter, Judith. Coming home together, I wept very much. They had killed my wife and three children while Judith and I ate with that man. The next day they told me if I didn't stop crying, I would go the same way. I sat alone on the beach for two days, neither eating bread nor rice, just reading plucking the grass. I was so weak I could barely get up. They forbade me to pray and to preach. Cornelius made me do it. He put the sword in my hand, gave me wine to drink. After I killed the first one, it, it did not matter. I killed a few men, women, children. I was terrified of Cornelius. I did not mean to kill them. The chaplain's six youngest children were clubbed to death, as were his wife and her maid. Others were stabbed or cut down with cutlasses. Death was quick, slow, organized, confused, but always vicious and without pity. 
stranded here on these lonely islands, thousands of miles from lands that spoke their language, in the midst of a band of cutthroats. Where could they go? What could they do? For a coward, Commander Pelsart proved to be an incredible sailor. In his frail sloop, packed with some of Batavia's deck crew, he sailed nearly 2,000 miles across the vast Indian Ocean to Java. He made this epic voyage in 31 days. A week later, Pelsart was placed in command of the yacht Sardam and headed south to save the 250 people and the East India Company treasure. There, the evil Cornelitz had been busy. 36 mutineers had signed an oath of allegiance to him. Without exception, we accept as our chief and captain general, Geronimus Cornelitz, whom we, with one accord and each separately, swear so truly as God shall help us, to be faithful and obedient in all that he shall order us. And in so far as the contrary happens, we shall be the devil's own. We saw smoke on a large island two miles west of the wreck. We were all very glad, hoping to find great numbers, or rather all the people alive. As soon as the anchor was dropped, I went with the boat to the highest island. We saw no one. Then four men rowing a yawl and quickly running ashore, calling out, go back immediately. There's a party of mutineers on the islands near the wreck. They told me of murder, rape, horrible stories. What could we do? We were all alone, frightened. We were stranded here by that coward Pelsart. They would have died. There was a mutiny planned anyway. We killed the women and children. They would have died anyway. We were trapped like rats. There was no food or water left. What would you have done? The Dutch trial of the day had a style all its own. Torture of mutineers to obtain confessions. Removal of the right hand of the most guilty by chisel and hammer. Then death on the gallows. That was the tragedy of the Batavia, a noble ship destroyed in the heartless world, the world the Malays called the land of the dead. Pelsart died soon after, a broken man, but his brutal encounter would leave a lasting taint upon the legend of Terra Australis. It was a land that meant death and disaster for those who were to venture too close. During the years that followed the tragedy of the Batavia, the Dutch filled in many pieces of the puzzle in this land they now call New Holland. They mapped and followed its coast for thousands of miles, but for the land that lay beyond the beaches, contempt and disinterest. A visit ashore and a casual glance told them that this land, this terra australis, this New Holland, held no forests of pepper and cloves. They sailed out of Australian history like phantom Dutchmen, leaving little but their maps and their stories of a wilderness beyond an inhospitable coastline. And while this discovery of the western coast of Australia was taking place, the worlds of Europe and the Americas were busy. In the year that the Dyfkin discovered Australia, Guy Fawkes was trying to blow up the English Houses of Parliament. Shakespeare was writing King Lear and Macbeth. 
While in 1629, as the stranded survivors of the Batavia were dying on the islands of Abrolhos, the English were capturing the castle of Quebec from the French, and the colony of Massachusetts was being founded. The world knew little of Terra Australis and cared even less. What was needed was a promoter, an entrepreneur, a visionary, a man prepared to accept what he found as unique, something the world hadn't seen before, not a, an employee of some profit-orientated company or a stuff-shirted naval captain, but a, an adventurer, a man who would appreciate what he found and accept it for what it was. And in 1688, this adventurer came along. His name was William Dampier. And he was a Caribbean pirate. Not the usual throat-cutting buccaneer, but a scholar, an educated man full of curiosity. How do you do, Mr. Pepys? It is a very great honor, sir. But please, do not believe everything Sir John tells you. He exaggerates too much. <laughs> <laughs> Pray be seated, gentlemen. Your reputation precedes you, Captain Dampier. The Spanish, the Papists, they nearly caught you, I believe. Indeed they did, sir. I was on the pirate ship Sigtet under Captain Swan. And we were cruising off the coast of Mexico, shooting up the Spanish, when things became a little difficult. <laughs> the Spanish got wind of us. So we made the wildly adventurous decision to sail halfway around the world to the Pacific island of Guam. Oh, incidentally, gentlemen, that ocean is misnamed. There isn't anything peaceful about it at all. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, our intention was to waylay and capture a Spanish galleon heading for home from the Philippines. Boy, it reached Guam, all right, but it's a waste of time. The Spanish had heard about us. What happened then? Well, Captain Swan parted company with us, so we took the signet south. Eventually, we reached the coast of Terra Australis, what the Dutch call New Holland. And there we found a suitable bay where we beached the signet and cleaned her bottom. beach in 1688, pirate and buccaneer William Dampier stepped ashore. And what he saw, he recorded. Thirty years later, Europe would be reading these books about the adventures of a man called Gulliver and his travels through strange wonderland. The land of Lilliput, and oddly enough, the story behind another English novel, Robinson Crusoe, came about because of the writings of this pirate, William Dampier.
he described the land as dry and dusty, destitute of water. The trees are dragon trees, not big, and none bear berries or fruit. And of the inhabitants, the Australian Aboriginal. Well, don't be up. Tell peeps about the natives. Mm. Oh, sir, the inhabitants of that country are the miserablest in the world. They have no houses, no skin, garments, sheep, poultry, fruits of the earth. <laughs> and setting aside their human shape, they are little better than brutes. They lay out in the open without any covering, the earth being their bed and the sky their canopy. They have great bottle noses and full lips, wide mouths, and they have the two front teeth here missing. Well, gentlemen, we stayed in that bay for nine weeks and then we sailed for Nicobar. Here, I got a bit tired of the buccaneering life, so I left the ship's company. And I travelled around for three years in the Far East. You might say that Dampier the pirate became Dampier the adventurer. Oh, and then I got homesick, gentlemen, so I came back home to dear old England. And back here, I broke the waxed end of my walking stick, which had been hollowed out to keep the manuscript of the notes of my adventures in the Far East and the coast of New Holland. And I had these published in two volumes, A New Voyage Around the World. Oh, very good, well. Dampier's book was a success. It was even read by King William III. And on the strength of his account of the great Southland, and perhaps with a little help from the king, Dampier persuaded the Admiralty into giving him command of a ship, the Roebuck, to engage in a voyage of exploration. She was old, and her hull was rotten. Yet with her, he was given the task of circumnavigating the land known as New Holland. And so, in 1699, aboard the aging Roebuck, Dampier left England heading south. His plan was to sail around Cape Horn and across the Pacific, but delays in leaving England made him change his mind. Instead, he rounded the Cape of Good Hope and entered the Indian Ocean. Once again, he was heading for the western coast of New Holland. But I stuck to my original plan and sailed west across the Pacific. I may have discovered the east coast of Australia and so beaten Captain James Cook by 70 years, but such was not the case. Roebuck crossed the Indian Ocean. We anchored at the spot where 83 years earlier, Dirk Hartog had been the first European to set foot on the great South land. I was back in the land that had captured my imagination 11 years earlier. Behind Dirk Hartog Island, we found a large bay, which, because of the number of sharks, I named Sharks Bay. And around this bay, I explored.
He noted the vegetation, the fish, and the bird life, taking careful measurements and describing in detail what he found. There were some green turtle weighing about 200 pounds. We caught two, and these served my company for two days. Their meat is very sweet. I jogged onto the northward and saw many small, poor pussies. My men call them dolphins after the Greek. They were the type with the bottle-shaped noses. Of the shellfish we got here, mussels, periwinkles, limpets and oysters were the most common. But the shore was lined thick with many other strange and beautiful shells. I brought away a great many of them, but all were lost, except a very few. Pelicans, gulls, crab catchers and waterfowl. But above all, he would have seen the black and white cormorants. An unusual sight, for in England, the bird was black. He came across an unusual lizard too, which he thought to be a guano. It differs from them in three remarkable particulars. These have a large and ugly head, no tail, and at the rump, instead of a tail there, they have a stump which appears like another head. Yet this creature seen by this means to have a head at each end. They are speckled black and yellow, like toads, and have knobs or scales on their bodies, like crocodiles. When a man comes near them, they stand very still and hiss. Their livers are black and yellow, and their bodies, when opened, have a very unsavoury smell. Dampier commented that he had eaten snakes, crocodiles and alligators, and many creatures that looked frightful enough yet he couldn't imagine his stomach accepting these New Holland lizards. Noted in these journals of his were sea devil rays, whales and dolphins, schools of cuttlefish, pearl shells and oysters. But of all the sea fish Dampier found in the bay behind Dirk Hartog's island, none were so amazing to him as the huge sharks. Among them, we caught one which was 11 foot long. The space between its two eyes was 20 inches, and 18 inches from one corner of its mouth to the other. The jaw was firm, out of which we plucked many teeth, two of them 8 inches long. A sharp knife could scarcely cut it, and inside we found the head and bones of a hippopotamus, the hairy lips of which were still sound and not putrefied. What Dampier saw was not a hippopotamus, but a harmless sea creature called a dugong. They were treated as a delicacy by the aboriginals of New Holland, and judging from Dampier's report, that taste was shared by the sharks. He then sailed north, following the old Dutch chart of Abel Tasman, to which he referred as Mr. Tasman's draft. The Roebuck then anchored off an island while a search was made for water, and here again Dampier noted the strange animal life and vegetation. On this rosemary island, Dampier thought one of the shrubs resembled the rosemary herbs of Europe. He also described flocks of white parrots that flew in great numbers and a new bird. It had small, long feet, its tail forked like a swallow's, and on the top or crown of the head was coal black.
With his notes and specimens, Dampier set sail for Timor and New Guinea, with his objective, the exploration of the unknown east coast of Australia. But illness and the slow disintegration of his ship forced him to turn back near the islands of New Britain. The Roebuck was literally falling apart. Her hull was so rotten that nails could not be driven into her timbers. Dampier made a desperate bid to get the Roebuck and himself back to England, but he only succeeded in struggling to mid-Atlantic. In three fathoms of water off Ascension Island, she simply sank beneath his feet. In his journal, Dampier commented, There is a sort of pleasure which results from the discovery of even the barrenest spot upon the globe. 